How powerful is the phrase, I love you. I love you. Hi, this is Neil with Other People's Shoes. I want to call your attention to a new app that I've discovered called World Love Bank. Now, let me tell you something really quick. There's something powerful about the phrase, I love you. It can do wonders to our mental health. It can just make us feel like we matter and that we value that person that we say it to. Now think about this for a second. Think about the person you you. love most in this world. Got them? Now imagine just for a brief moment, imagine if you could never hear the words, I love you you," ever again. That's what World Love Bank is all about. See, what they're doing is they're capturing the I love yous from loved ones that you can go back in and go into that bank like a savings account and withdraw that I love you you. even if that loved one is passed because maybe that loved one has banked their I love you and it'll be there forever so think about that check it out right now World Love Bank on your favorite app store of choice whether that be Apple iOS or Android Google Play check it out now World Love Bank I love you hey Take a walk with me, not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited you have stopped by today. Thank you for giving us a listen. Appreciate it each and every week. By the way, if you have not done so already, why have you not? Why have you not? Why have you not jumped over to your favorite social media of choice, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Give us a like, give us a tweet, give us a follow. Shoot, send us a message. We're good with that too. You can also jump over to our website, OPSpodcast.com. You can leave a voicemail there. You can even even leave a comment there. Leave a review, whatever you want to do. It's fun stuff. Speaking of fun stuff, let me introduce you to my new friend. Super excited about this gentleman today. Now, let me tell you, we are out in Syracuse, New York. So, well, roughly Syracuse area. So I hope you not only packed maybe, you know, some orange shirts because they're really big on the orange men up there. It's their mascot. It's a long story. You might have to Google that. Hopefully you're into orange shoes too, pulp or non-pulp. That's maybe a great debate that we can maybe try to settle today. Maybe not. I don't know. But I hope you pay close close attention to today's episode because we're really going to be talking about that guardrail that's in your life. That thing, you know, that keeps you on the road. And let me tell you right now, it is not too late to get that guardrail in your life. In fact, my guest here, Daniel Connors, is here to tell us about that. Help me welcome him in again from Syracuse, New York, or roughly right around Daniel Connors. Daniel, how are you today? Hey, Neil. Good. I'm doing well. How about yourself? So you're doing great. So did we get that right? Upstate New York area? Is that right? Upstate New York? Yeah. Syracuse, pretty much right in the center part of New York State, about three and a half hours from New York City. So you are actually in Syracuse. Well, a suburb of Syracuse. So about 20 minutes outside. All right. So I got to ask this question for a good friend of mine. Sure. Is orange juice cheaper in Syracuse? (laughs) <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, has no bearing whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> although we're the orange men, the Syracuse orange men. I'd like, you know, that's a good that's a good question. I don't know why orange juice isn't cheaper. So good point. I'm excited because not only are we good friends with a mutual friend, Jody Howell, the year that I breathe, we're, we're excited that uh, she got us connected, but I'm also excited because you got a new book out. We want to talk about that too. So we, of course, will make some time for that. Before we get into all of that excitement, yes, I feel like we need to know this answer. So here we go. Dan, you ready? ready. Uh, what size shoes do you wear? <laughs> well, it sort of depends upon what I'm wearing. You know, if it's sneakers or shoes, I'm approximately 11 in sneakers and a 10 and a half in shoes. I like that a lot because I feel like that's easy shoes for me to kind of walk in for sure. So that's awesome. So is there a style or brand that we like more than another? Um, You know, I'm sort of a sneaker guy. I do a lot of running. So uh, I like something that's comfortable. So I like Hoka's and I like Saucony. I've done a couple marathons. So those are my sneakers of choice. Now, Sockety, I have not gotten around that yet. I haven't even gotten around Hoka yet, but I do have a couple of people saying that they want to send me either one, and I'm I'm totally fine with that. 
<laughs> what size foot do you have, man? I, if this I goes do. Well, I do wear an eleven. In all honesty, I was a ten and a half for a long time, and then for whatever yeah. reason, I started you know trying on ten and a half shoes at the store, you know, yeah. from time to time. And I was like, these these just don't fit anymore. And so you know, then I started running pretty actively pre COVID, and I was yeah. doing a lot of five Ks, and I started to notice that my foot was kind of hitting the end of the toe box. I was right. like, well, let me go up a size, like a half size. Let me go up to an 11. And so now I just strictly, everything's an 11. Yeah, I got a big arch. So when my foot comes down, it actually lengthens. So it works for me. I do know the 11 size well. So yeah, there we go. But Dan, getting into your story and kind of who you are and, and kind of what you're about, we're asking people this question, this aglet. Now, for some, they're still struggling with the aglet. They haven't done their research. They haven't watched Phineas and Ferb. They don't know. But the aglet is that plastic or metal thing at the end of a shoelace that keeps it from unraveling. So, Dan, I'm curious about you. What is that one thing or that thing, maybe it's things, multiple things, that have really kept you kind of from unraveling in life? What would that be? First of all, I, I sort of like your description there. You know, it's a great, it's a great analogy. Aglet. I, I had to look it up to be honest with you, Neil. And it's spelled A-G-L-E-T, aglet. Well, first of all, have you ever tried to put a, a shoelace through a hole, you know, when you're your thread in your shoe, it doesn't go through easy if the egglet's missing, right? There's multiple things that help me from unraveling. I'd say it's fourfold. I had guardrails in my life. I had therapists, immersion therapy, and God. My term of a guardrail is someone in my life, a friend, family member, a teacher who is there for me to keep me on the right path, on the right road, so I didn't go over the cliff. Sometimes I didn't know they were a guardrail. In hindsight, when I look back, I said, that person was a huge influence in my life. I think of my middle school vice principal. His name was Mr. Johnson. He was a great man, a true disciplinarian. On more than one occasion, he uh, he definitely corrected me. So I'm going back about, geez, almost 40 years ago. So at the time, young, rebellious type of kid, seventh grade. My parents were divorcing. I was unraveling, sort of like that egglet that was sort of breaking. Mr. Johnson was there to sort of put some glue on the shoelace, so to speak. He disciplined me big time and I needed it. I needed structure in my life. I didn't know I was rebelling and I was doing things like pulling fire alarms, which is sort of ironic because I became a fireman later in life. I was getting in fights. I was drinking in seventh grade. I was actually doing drugs. Unfortunately, a lot of the friends I was hanging out with at the time, they either didn't graduate from high school or they ended up being arrested later in life, etc. So Mr. Johnson was there to discipline me, caught me from when I was falling, discipline me. I got suspended from school. I was threatened by the police for giving other friends alcohol. So I ended up in the police station, unfortunately. So definitely not a good or a good season of my life. So I had Mr. Johnson as a major guardrail. Then different parts of my life, I've had different guardrails. I became a jock. Because of Mr. Johnson, I realized I had to change my ways. I, I knew the path that was before me, so I ended up playing lacrosse and football, and I dabbled with wrestling. I definitely had some mentors, say, that were with me. It was my best friend's parents who, another set of guardrails who, you know, basically there just to show me what a good family life is like. So I, I've probably had, in my life, I would say there was probably six to eight guardrails who I attribute to having major impacts in my life. Because I'm trying to think to myself, if I don't have guardrails, in my life, or if I'm an individual right now who's listening that says, first off, okay, cool. Guy needed some guardrails. Okay. Sound like he couldn't really walk through life. You know, listen, I can walk through life on my own. I don't need anybody. I don't need any guardrails. I mean, guardrails are kind of for babies anyway. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're good for when we're driving, but in life, come on. No, we don't really need them. What would happen if that guy didn't come around you? That Mr. Johnson, if he didn't come around you, what, what would life have looked like for Dan? Well, that's a really good point. If if we don't have guardrails in our life, we literally can go off the road that God has called us to. I would have gone off a cliff. I was self-destructing and did not realize it. Yeah, I think yeah, guardrails is a necessary part of life. You know, I just want to go back to that kid back in middle school for a second. What was making me go off that cliff was I didn't have the vocabulary to understand it, but it was anxiety, depression. Parents were divorcing. I didn't know how to articulate myself. How do I tell my parents who were fighting all the time? It was a scary time. 
time of life and I, I could not articulate myself. So there were people that God placed, I believe, in my life to help me along the way or his way that he was calling me to. But I wasn't ready. But I had people like my grandmother, who was a very prominent, and very big part of my life. She was another guardrail. When my parents were divorcing, it sort of set me down the rabbit hole, if you will. I spiraled down. Parents divorce lasted about 12 years or so, you know, from initially getting separated to a legal divorce to finally, after 12 years, divorcing. Ultimately, when they divorced, it crushed me. It crushed my spirit. And my grandmother was there again, as a guardrail, to rein me in. I was anxiety ridden. I was depressed, not able to articulate the feelings I was having. She one day said to me, Danny, knock it off. And it sort of, it woke me up, Neil. It was like, I, I didn't realize that I was having this type of symptoms. And I was essentially, therapists would say, you were disassociating from reality. I was that depressed that I was in like a tunnel or a fog. And one day when I was visiting grandma at her apartment with my dad, she said to me, basically snapped me out of it and said in a loud, stern voice, knock it off. But it was really her faith that kept me on the right path. She was a strong Irish devout Roman Catholic woman. She modeled for me good behavior, just about devout Christianity. She was was just a major, major impact in my life. Well, again, I think if individuals don't have those guardrails... If they had them once, maybe in high school, or they had them once when they were younger, and now they don't have them, I just, I want to ask why for that person. I just think guardrails are imperative to be in someone's life. If we're using a, a driving analogy, which I think is easy because we all have that concept of, of driving, we understand it. If that guardrail is not there, we can easily go off the road. Right. We can easily go off into that ravine and then what? Life right. is, is even worse for us. But getting into you and, and really what you're all about, to me, when I have authors come on, first off, I love having authors come on because to me, I, I feel like it's a creative synergy. Like I can never be an author. So I'm always fascinated that somebody could sit down and write a book and it's amazing, right? That's always fascinating to me from my mindset. But the other reason why I like my authors coming on is because again, that creative process, going back to that, that mindset of like, hey, I had to sit down. I had to create this. This book didn't exist till I basically wrote it and created it, kind of like a podcast. But for me, when I think about an author, what was the hardest part? Part about writing the book. On the flip side of that, what was the most rewarding part of writing the book? So two-part question there. Excellent question, Neil. The hardest part about writing the book was one, just putting it out there. I mean, this is daunting. This is my life story. I make myself very vulnerable. And I tell about all my, um, well, failures, my triumphs. To let everybody see your insides, it's excruciatingly painful. But I'm walking by faith and I feel called to write this, called to put it out there, called to publish it. So that was the hardest part. But writing itself, it just flowed out of me, Neil. Every day that I wrote, I would pray before I write, it would just flow out. I ended up writing over 120,000 words and was able to narrow that down to about 100,000. And the writing was the easy part, making myself vulnerable. That's the hardest part. Why Why is writing it the most vulnerable part for you? Well, you know, I, I think it's easy to, to put up um, like a mask, you know, and say like, this is who I am. You know, I'm a firefighter. I'm a paramedic. I'm a nurse. These are all like positive attributes. You know, we get a lot of fanfare these days, especially after like 911 or 911. Uh, you know, the pandemic, you know, nurses are medical professionals in general, very well received. Obviously, they above and beyond. So they did an amazing job to say like, that's my persona. That's that in and of itself is very rewarding. But then when you couple it with and say, hey, I, I suffered for years with anxiety, depression, and anxiety, anxiety and panic disorder. Whew, I mean, that's it's hard. And on top of that, you know, not to get into a lot of great detail about this. You know, I, I also talk about some of my sinful behavior in the book and, you know, it's stuff I'm not proud of, but I think that people can learn from, you know, that we all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. And I admit it, you know, and I, I tell people where I found my strength to become a better person and my strength comes from God. That's, that's my bottom line. You know, there's a good quote I like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's, that comes from Philippians. Without God's strength, Christ's strength, I couldn't have, one, written this book, and two, made myself vulnerable enough to, I don't know, show my heart, so to speak. And I think that's the key, too. At least I do, and I think others do as well, is we want the authenticity of people. Mm. We want to know that life isn't what it looks like on Instagram. Right. We want to know that there are bad moments. Right. As a dad, 
I blow it daily. Mm. I, I hear you, man. And so I think there is a vulnerability to that. Maybe speak to that if you wouldn't mind. I'm right with you, man. Whatever social media you prefer, I think we always put our, our best foot forward. And to do something that's countercultural is not the norm. And when we do something that's not the norm, we're making ourselves vulnerable. And that's what I've done. You know, I sort of, I thank God, I find that I'm a good dad. I'm, a, I'm now a good husband. What did it take me to become a good dad. I went through some valleys. I had to go through a grind. Why did I have to go through the grind? I think all of us, if we look at ourselves, our truest self, the reason we go through dark times, I mean, I think therapists will tell us this as well as our past. And so like I confronted my past head on. I had to look at some real stuff that I just was not proud of, stuff that I wanted to change. So about, I'm going back to college. Just after college, I was graduating, but I, so I was probably like about 22 years old and a good friend of mine, Chuck said to me, he is a, a farmer, 84 year old farmer. Anyways, he said to me, Danny, have you ever thought about going to therapy? I had it at that time. And he sort of like shocked me to be honest with you, but he was the first person that sort of pointed out to me the fact that I, I really needed to get my life together. I, I had to look at some issues that were going on from early childhood trauma, early childhood, call it addictions or negative behaviors, uh, divorcing parents, et cetera. Through 15 years of therapy, I was able to really root out some of these negative past behaviors. Again, through a lot of hard work, I became a, a good dad and now a good husband. Thanks be to God. So I don't give all the credit to therapy necessarily, although that certainly helped, you know, but it was in conjunction with God. What else happened was immersion type of experiences. Because of the anxiety, the depression, that panic disorder I was going through, I felt that I needed to combat that. I'd, I'd end up either totally in a psychiatric hospital or I'd, I wouldn't be who God had called me to be. So I, I was thinking worst case scenario. I just basically the bottom line is I knew I had to get my stuff together. And God gave me opportunities through bicycling across the country, fishing in Alaska to sort of like looking at myself to like gain strength through those experiences so that I, I could face my panic and anxiety head on. Back in 1993, I biked across the northern part of the United States from Seattle to Asbury Park, New Jersey. I went out there for a fundraiser for a Larsh community that I was working at. Larsh is spelled L apostrophe A-R-C-H-E. It was an organization that I was working for. As I was transitioning out of that particular career, I decided to do a fundraiser for them. But because I was sort of like out of my element, basically uh, I had resigned from there I'd, and now beginning my bike trip across the country, I was having all these panic and anxiety issues and I didn't know how to deal with it. But I pushed through and by pushing myself through, I was able to start the process of healing that part of my life. You know, it's amazing to me too, that when I talk to people who have done first off crazy things like biking from Seattle to New Jersey, that healing takes place, which to me seems very odd because it seems very excruciatingly painful to make that trek from again, Seattle to New Jersey. I mean, that just seems terrible at times. A lot of lonely miles, right? I was actually biking with 50 other people. I had a lot of fun at the end, but in the beginning portion, yeah, there was a lot of pain. Physically, you know, like your your knees hurt, your your ankles swell, your, your backside actually has to get calloused. So you got to put in some miles before your body is actually ready. For me, the pain was less of the physical discomfort as it was the emotional discomfort. I don't know. Have you ever dealt with anxiety or had a panic attack or anything of that nature? I don't know if I've ever had a full-blown panic attack per se, but I used to work with a guy when I was selling radio advertising. Every morning at 8.15, I had to go meet with him before I went out to sell. I would go yeah. into his office and I can talk in front of anybody. Like, I'm not afraid. I've never met a stranger. You know, that's just my personality. But I remember my palms getting really sweaty. And I remember feeling like I want to throw up. I want to be anywhere but in here. And I don't like this feeling of absolute failure. And what is he going to make me feel like? And he would demean me and kind of berate me and, you know, ridicule me and... And why I stayed there 18 months, I have okay. no idea. That's as close as I can get. I know you're not a doctor, but you are a kind of a nurse. So, you know, but if I bring you those symptoms, I mean, is that a panic attack? I wouldn't say that's a panic attack. I'd say you're having some anxiety related to meeting with him. Certainly. I would say that scratches the surface to what I'm trying to allude to. Like a full-blown 
panic attack is like you're out of your skin. Like you think you're dying. You don't know what's happening and you can't really control it. At least that's where I was at. So I didn't know when I would feel out of control and it would just, it overcome me. The experience of biking actually started to put my feet on the ground, Neil. Like it empowered me, if you will. You know, so it was the first step of empowerment so that I could start to feel like good in my skin. What I didn't realize it was because of all my past, you know, it was, it was my parents' divorce. It was my mother's but attempted suicide as a young kid. Oh gosh, just a, a lifelong list of, I wish I didn't do those type of things that culminated into anxiety panic. At the time I was when these first started, I was probably in my young early twenties. So I didn't I didn't know what tech was going on. But I did know enough after receiving my bachelor's in psychology from Canisius to know I had to, I had to get this figured out or else I was gonna end up in a real bad way as a as a mature adult. Again, I come back to the fact that God gave me opportunities to get my life together through an immersion experience of this sort, you know, biking from Seattle to Asbury Park, New Jersey. And, you know, I could share with you all sorts of stories along the way. It it was just an incredible experience. So one, one experience I had, uh, we were about, I don't know, day six to eight or so. We're in Montana. It was a small little town called Poplar, Montana. And they're having the Native American days there. We had biked approximately 68 miles that day. The organizers of our trip told us that they're having a little festival down in town in Poplar. When, once we had finished our ride for the day, it took us about four hours or so. We had a lot of time in the afternoon, so we walked down there. What I saw was an amazing experience, sort of hard to put into words. So here we are in Montana in a small little town in Poplar. Population, I think, was just over 2,000 people. But they had this area about the size of a football field cordoned off. They were having a ceremony with all sorts of Native American dancers and bonfires and teepees and so on and so forth. But they also had some Native American men who had their chest pierced and they were hanging from trees as like a ceremonial worship. It was Definitely outside of my norm, definitely outside of my cultural experience. We just sort of looked with mouths agape. I'd never seen anything like this before. Come from a Christian background, but for them, this was their worship. Some of the elders had asked us if we had wanted to participate in a sweat. My, my friends and I were, um, yeah, were very enthused to do this. So the area that the sweat, the sweat hut was, we were supposed to have fasted for a week before you're supposed to enter into this area, if you will. They allowed us to come in. We crawled into the sweat hut, went around the fire in a circular fashion, sat there with our legs crossed. And then the chanting and the drumming started and they closed the flap behind us. So it was extremely dark except for the flame and the smoke would rise up through the, the center of the, I guess, of the sweat hut. And and it, it was like being in a sauna, but an extremely hot sauna, like 100 plus degrees. And then the chanting and the incense. And I guess it was just in a really profound, amazing experience. But it was those types of ex- things across the country. I, I could hear God calling me to start to change, to try to I don't know, place my trust in him versus anything that I was trying on my own. So it was, again, this was the initial stage of my healing. So I'm, I'm going back to when I, again, when I was 20, now that I'm in my fifties, I see there was a lot more that I had to do, but that crossing the country and having just some wonderful moments was the first part of my getting better, if you will. I've watched that show Yellowstone. That's my, which is terrible. That's my only real native American. I mean, other than like Tonto back in the day, I don't have a ton of Native American (laughs) experience, which is kind of weird because my wife has a little bit of Native American in her, a little bit, very little bit. She's an Osage Indian, but we don't go to like tribal ceremonies or have to put that on our list of things to do. But I would love to go see something like that to get that cultural perspective shift for me. So that's cool stuff that you described that. I appreciate that. I'm wondering about this. On that journey, again, from Seattle to New Jersey, you talk about how you kind of had to, you know, kind of get your body engaged in that. You had to, you know, kind of endure some things. And even though you were with, what'd you say, like 50 other riders, you had to still pedal. They're not going to pedal for you. You still have to keep up with them. They're not going to necessarily, I mean, they're probably going to wait for you because they're probably good people, I would hope. But there had to be a little bit of element where you're still on the bike alone. Even though you're in the group, you're still kind of in alone. You still in your mind had to say, I got to get to this next hill. I got to get to this next town. I got to get to, you know, wherever. Good point, Neil. Like, so I hear what you're saying is, you know, did I have like any anxiety as I was biking? Essentially, when I was on my bike, like I felt like a million bucks, nine out of 
10 times because I was, I was moving. I was being physical. I was, I'm, you know, I've always been an athlete throughout my whole life. So this was just another opportunity to sort of push my body. I didn't feel anxious except the day we were crossing the Rockies. I literally was feeling panicked as we were going over the sun highway, which was, I don't know, maybe day seven, eight, actually I have my itinerary right in front of me. can tell you this, Neil, I was in awe of God's beauty all around me. As we were crossing the summit, you know, to see like snow-capped mountains and, oh gosh, you know, goats, mountain goat, like standing on steep cliff and you look in the distance and you can see these little small little avalanches or just like snow coming down off the mountain, not full blown avalanche, but it was so amazing. It was such a beautiful sunny day. But the thing that sort of petrified me, if you will, was that when we're going up this hill, you know, it was about eight to 10% grade. So not too steep, but there was a thousand foot drop and there was a stone guardrail that if I hit it, I mean, I would go right over that thing. And so I, I had that in the back of my mind, if you will, you know, so that was like the only day that I actually felt like true anxiety when I was biking. Every other day that I was on my bike and moving, I felt good. But once we did get into camp, I'd have like many panic attacks. It was excruciatingly painful. And I didn't tell anybody, you know, I, I wanted to end my bike trip, to be honest with you. I, I was ready to throw in the towel. Pushing through what I now know to be like immersion therapy, I was able to gain strength from that by making myself do things I didn't want to do. I think so many times, again, when we're faced with life's challenges, we have a choice to make. We can rise to it or we can fade back into the back. For you, when you think about your life, if we were going to put it in a movie, I don't know who's playing you. Maybe it's Kevin Costner because he's amazing. Why not? Let's let's make it Kevin Costner. But you know what I mean? Like if we were to put you in a movie, like we can't put the whole life in there, unfortunately, because it would probably be like a really long movie, Titanic long, like six hours long or something like that. I don't know. Maybe one of those new Avenger movies that seem like to go on forever. Okay, we get it. Let's let's kill the bad guy and let's move on. But if we were to put your whole life in a, in a movie... What's one area that you're like, man, we got to make sure this is emphasized. We got to make sure this scene makes it like this scene, this other scene that that can go away. But this scene is crucial. What scene is that for you? Mm, good point, Neil. This is the scene. So here I am, seven, eight, nine year old boy. And I'm praying in bed and I'm praying to God. And I'm saying, God, please heal my family. This this went on for years, Neil. I God, please heal my family. I want a family like my friends. You know, my parents were going through a divorce. They're going through a real hard time, constantly arguing. And I knew enough to know that I knew what love was. We had a good family growing up. Divorce can do some awful things. I remember that prayer and I said, God, please, you know, I, I want a family like my my friends have. So that'd be the first part to answer your question. But what I didn't realize is God answered my prayers, but it was not immediate. And it was not in the way I was thinking. And it was my answer to my prayer was actually my wife. Maybe my say family of origin wasn't healed as I was asking God to do when I was a young boy, but I certainly, God granted me my prayer in the form of my wife. She has been someone that God had in store for me. And that's what I would like in the movie for people to know that it's not in our timeline, but in God's timeline, he will answer our prayers. And that, Neil, is probably the thing that I, like I hold on to the most dear in my life. For a young boy, it's what I wanted. And as a man, God heard me answer my prayers and then some. That would have to be the highlight of my movie. And what I um, totally attribute all of a, a God incidents. If she doesn't come into your life, have you ever thought like what life looks like? If Veronica didn't come into my life? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I give thanks every day that she came in. I think about that quite often, to be honest with you. We have two wonderful children. So if she wasn't in my life, I wouldn't have two of the best gifts ever. She was a major reason, probably like you, you can attribute a lot of the great things happening in your life to your wife. So if I hadn't been given that gift of Veronica, well, I would not, I don't think I'd be here sitting with, talking with you, Neil, to be honest with you. I have gratitude beyond gratitude. I mean, it's the best things in my life came from being married. So I can't, I can't think of life without her, to be honest. We mentioned the book a little bit ago, but if somebody right now 
who's wondering about you, wondering more about your story, wondering more about why somebody, again, I'm always fascinated by why people sit down and write books. There's lots of books. There's bookstores everywhere, it feels like. But why specifically do you feel like somebody should feel called or compelled or maybe implore them at this moment to really pick up your book and read it? Good question. My book is a, it's a memoir. It's more than that. How I'm terming it is a Christian self-help, but it's more than self-help. It's a Christian God will help memoir. The reason I think it'd be good for people to read is that they can see the struggles I went through and they can see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And the light's not just any light, but it's the light of Christ. Light shined in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And that that's the same that is true in my life. Why would someone want to read it? If they're struggling with anxiety, depression, panic disorder, if they ever had thoughts of suicide or do, unfortunately, I would say read this book. Know that someone else went through some real challenges in their life and they've come out for the good through various experiences, through immersion therapy through therapy itself, through guardrails, but most importantly, through my relationship with God. And I spell that all out in the book. And I do believe that it can help people. And that's that's why I wrote it. And that's why I'm daring to make myself vulnerable. The key to all of that is vulnerability. Authenticity Right, is to put it out there to say like, listen, mm. this is who I am. Love me or not. Right. This is who I am. Exactly, but I think yeah. So often, myself included, we wait. We're like, well, I'm going to do that next Monday. When I get here, then I'm going to do this. When this happens, then I'm going to do that. We wait. And in waiting, sometimes we delay it. Why should someone not wait? They should act right now. To write their own book? To write their own book, to take this journey, get out of whatever rut they've been in, really be... Because again, you're walking this road, or maybe even writing, if you will, in more ways than one, writing yeah. and physically writing the two writings there. You're writing this road yeah. of integrity, of authenticity, of not allowing anxiety to have its hold on you anymore. But if we right. wait, what's the danger in waiting? Uh, good question, man. If I had not dealt with the stuff that I did, Neil, I couldn't have become a firefighter. I couldn't have become a paramedic. I couldn't have become a nurse. Can you imagine if a fireman had to deal with anxiety, panic, disorder. And there's no way I could go in and fight a fire, right? So I knew that I couldn't wait any longer to deal with the symptoms in front of me, that I had to hit my life hard so that I could become a successful person, if you will. Why Why not wait? I think part of not waiting, Neil, is also discerning and listening to what God is calling or asking of you. And so part of my not waiting was in a prayerful mindset, you know, what does God have in store for me? I think that's a huge part of it. There probably is a time to wait and there's a time to act. Personally, I like to try to listen and through a prayerful mindset of when is the time to act on an, whether it's an idea or writing this book, for instance, or the next career move. And I, I just don't make my decisions haphazard, but I put it in a prayerful place in a prayerful mindset and then I will act. So I guess I would encourage any listener to really be prayerful in their decision making. So maybe there is a time to wait. Maybe it's not your time to write. Maybe it's next year, or next month, or maybe it is today. Listen to what God's telling you. And that would be the first and foremost of what I would recommend. So it's not too late to get started on all this is what you're saying to me? It's not. Yeah, I like that. That's a good play on words. It's not too late for sure. So why is that such a great play on words? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could help us with that. So back in 1986, I was a freshman at Canisius College. I was sort of living a crazy, reckless type of life. I was smoking pot. I was, I was living a fraternity type of life setting, a lifestyle rather. I was also playing lacrosse. I damn my priorities together. And I mean, that's just the, the nuts and the bolts of it. So my life was a mess. I remember back in 1986, November of 1986, I had just come back from Thanksgiving, back at Canisius, from returning from Syracuse back home. This is where the, the title of the book comes from. It's not too late. Here I was about to fall asleep, and I heard some friends down the hall partying and carrying on and loud, loud noise and whatnot. And so I, I went down to see what was going on, to see what my friends were up to. And they were, they were sitting in there smoking pot. And I was really stressed out from a real tough Thanksgiving. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go in and have a good time with these fellas. And what happened, Neil, was awful, to be honest with you. I, I ended up overdosing from what now as an adult, I can say I, w I 
I smoke too much pot. It's not a lifestyle I lead anymore, but it was at one point in my life. Anyways, I started to hyperventilate and I had a, a terrible experience and I, I couldn't breathe. I go into a lot of detail in the book about it. But anyways, what I knew was I needed to get out of that room. And I ended up running back to my dorm room, throwing on my sweatpants. And I decided I'm going to run to my best friend's college, who's just down the road at the University of Buffalo. And he was about, I don't know, seven or 10 miles away. And I knew I could run that far as no, I was in fairly good shape at the time. I run downstairs and I'm going to run to his, his university. Thought my best friend could, if anybody can help me, it'll be him. And I just didn't know what was going on. I was very much, I was panicking and whatnot. I thought, I can't breathe. And I thought, I need medical help. So I, I ran over to the to where the nurse was in the next building over. And she wasn't there. One of the attendants was asked me if I was okay. And I lied. And I said, of course, I'm fine. And I walked out. This is where it gets very interesting. And this is where the name of the book comes from. But as I was walking through the Canisius Quad, I looked up into the, the sky and I saw a message in the clouds. I saw a lamb's head. I saw God and a message saying, it's not too late. Now, you know, I sort of looking back on that, I can say, of course, I was on drugs. And of course, I was having a hallucination, if you will. You know, that hallucination made a huge difference in my life. As an 18 year old man at the time, I, I started to ask God, I said, God, please let me live. You know, I, I told him I'd become a priest. I said, please, Father, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'll change my ways. Just let me live. And that night was awful. It was probably one of the worst nights of my life. You know, I was having just some terrible out-of-body type of experiences. And I go again, I go into detail in the book about it. You know, Neil, I, I think it's very easy to say, like, that was a, a hallucination. This is what I know now as a Christian, that God can use all things for his good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, and even a, a drug-induced hallucination. And I certainly don't recommend anyone trying to hallucinate to see God. And you know, I, I, I would never want to go back down that road I was you know, traveling at that time in my life. But I can say that it, it was a, the beginning of an eye-opening experience for me to say that there is a lot more to this life than I realized. The road I was traveling on, I, I knew I needed to desperately get off of it. And it sort of sprung board me, if you will, into looking at deeper meanings of life. Like uh, I started to question my major. Why was I a business major? I started to question a lot of the ideas I had about material success. It was such an eye-opening experience. I ended up changing my major after that, just really having some doubts about playing lacrosse anymore, some doubts about drinking and socializing. But it took me a good number, probably three, four years to change the ways I was in, ultimately start walking the road that God was calling me to. I wouldn't say that it was an immediate overnight type of experience, but I certainly, I felt that God definitely wanted me to change certain ways. There, there you have it. The name of the book, It's Not Too Late, came from a, a drug-induced hallucination, you know, and it's not something that I'm proud of, so to speak, but it is something that I know that I think God had his hand in, and it certainly made a big impact on my life. I think so many times, again, when inspiration comes, and who knew, right? Even back in college, who knew that you were going to write this book? Well, I have a feeling someone knew, and I have a feeling someone mm. was preparing you. Yes in advance for the work that he's called you to do. To me, that's the most exciting thing about this whole scenario. Back to the book. Where can folks go to get it? Where can they get a hold of it, get a copy of it? Uh, good question. Right now it's on Amazon. So if you just you go to the Amazon site, amazon.com, it's in paperback. It's also on the Kindle and hardcover. I'm going to hopefully get it on some other media forms, but right now we just have it on Amazon. You know, I know you're a little bit older than I am, if I remember right. Just a little bit. <laughs> couple yeah about a so decade maybe or so in your old age if i can tease a little bit on that you know you you've forgotten one place where folks can go to get it as well oh go ahead so it's okay it's in your old age i get it it's fine you know being in syracuse maybe the air is getting to you i don't know maybe you didn't get enough orange juice this morning i don't know but they can also go to opspodcast.com slash books that i love and it'll be featured towards the top of the page not the tippy top because that is reserved for a guy named dean smith and roy williams sorry not there yet <laughs> I, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I don't. That was very neglectful of me to not point out your website. I apologize. So, good point. Good point. That's okay. 
It's all right. It's not your job to point out my website, so that's okay. But I want to play a game with you before we go. If I was going to put you Carrier Dome, now I know you're not a Syracuse grad. You've probably been by the Carrier Dome a time or sure, two, right? Sure, sure. I'm very familiar. Jody would, would be mad at me because I don't know the seating capacity offhand. Like, I don't have that memorized. And I know you know, not being a Syracuse alum, maybe you don't know the seating capacity of the Carrier but Dome, It's right? in a... Around the 50,000, so low 50s. Yeah. And that varies different sporting events they have. Like, think for basketball, it's about 32 on the max. So, Carrier Dome seating capacity, just Google this for you. So, here we go. So, 49,057 people. Right. A little yeah. bit, just shy of fifty thousand people. We could almost round that up. I bet we could cram in fifty thousand into the carrier dome. Make it just a nice. Round I bet you there's been fifty in there. Sure, there probably has for you two or for who knows what. But if I put you on that orange S, drop the lights, orange S. We maybe get you a little, you know, stage to stand on so people can see you a little better. I got you on the jumbotron, and I hand you this microphone, and I say, Dan, we got people that have been struggling with anxiety for a long time. We got people that have dealt with divorce. My hand's up on that one. My parents were divorced. We got people that have walked through suicide. We've got people that have walked through just painful, awful situations, and they're struggling, and they're like, we don't know what to do. Now, listen, I know you're not a doctor. You're not a clinical expert. You don't have like MD in front of your name or anything like that. You're just a kind of a guy that just loves people and wants to see people come free. What would you say to them in this moment? Neil, that's an excellent question, first of all. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is scripture. You know, Neil, I I would have to say that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, and if you saw me on that S at the Carrier Dome, as you said, on the stage, I would point to God and I would kneel and I would say, thank you, Father, for giving me strength to get through what I've been through in my life. And please bless the listener who may be struggling with all sorts of anxiety, depression, or suicidal ideation, and give them strength, Father. And I know, the Lord, that you can do all things for your good, good Father. And you love us, just like any good daddy who loves their children. You love us, and you've gotten me through, and I know you can get this listener through who may be struggling. So I love you, God, and I appreciate you, Neil, for this time, you know, not only to talk about my book, but also to get to know you a little bit. And I, I just give God all the glory. And I give him all the thanks for getting me through. I'm very, very grateful. I think so many times we we see a Bible verse, we hear a Bible verse, you know, as a, as a non-believing person. And we're like, okay, yeah, they just can't get through life. They need that crutch. Like we said, they need that guardrail. They need that imaginary friend in the mm. sky. And I don't know when I hear things like that from people, and I have even family sure. members, I always have to ask myself, but when it gets real, mm-hmm. when it gets real, when it gets bad, when it gets the rainiest of darkest of nights, mm. where do those people turn to? Who do they turn to? <laughs> you know, it's interesting you should ask that, Neil. Presently, I work in a uh, drug and alcohol rehab field. So I work for a local agency here in Syracuse. I think you hear where I'm alluding to, you know, people turn off into the ways of this world. They turn to drugs. And our society right now, unfortunately, <laughs> there's an epidemic. I tell you what, that's a bottomless pit. And I've seen it. It's not life-giving. And I think it, it's just people, I don't even have to elaborate. You know, people understand that that is just nowhere land. And if I'm going to err, Neil, if I'm going to err on making a choice of using God as a crutch or err on having God in my life or err on having a court system where I call God my father, I'm going to err in that versus err in the ways of this world. I personally have found strength in that. And if someone wants to say, hey, uh, it's just a crutch for you, I'm okay with that. And, And thank God that he gave me crutches and thank God he gave me guardrails. I'm okay with someone saying, you know, I am good with someone saying it's just a crutch because I needed a crutch. And God gave me a crutch. Thank God he was there for me. I don't know where I'd be without him. Yeah. And again, I think so many times we want to, we want to look at somebody's life and we want to judge it. If it was me, I would have done differently. Really? Mm -hmm. Did you? Would you? Could you? I don't know. There's, there is a good Bible quote, Neil, that I would like to share and piggyback off. You know, it comes from Romans 3, 23. It's all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh yeah. I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm putting myself out there and I will be judged and, I'm okay with that. But this is what I do know, that all have sinned, not just me, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So 
with that understanding, I'm not afraid then to show my heart because I know other people also. Yeah, good stuff, man. First off, I want to say, Dan, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Love your heart. I have a copy of the book too that you sent me, which I'm really excited about. I do commit to trying to sit down and read it, which is a tough thing for me to admit, but I am committing to well, trying to read it. So I'll be honest are. with you. I think you'll like it once you get going. I've heard some good reviews. So we play this game at the end of our show. It's called Senseless. Hope you're ready. I, I didn't have, Jody didn't send me a Syracuse cup. Sorry. So we're going to have to use my North Carolina <laughs> cup. Hope I'm okay, okay with that. Yeah. All right. And there is a North Carolina die in there. That's what's even better. It's like a theme around here almost. Go figure. Weird. Right. All right. So I'm going to roll. So this is the number one, believe it or not. I know it's a North Carolina logo, but I promise it's okay. the number one. Question number one is this for senseless. Is this, what is something that you've seen that made you laugh, smile, and cry? No pressure here, huh? Laugh, smile, and cry? <laughs> Gosh, Neil, come on, man. <laughs> it's hard to transition. It's just supposed to be silly and senseless, but I mean, it could get philosophical here real quick, I guess. It's yeah, hard to so, transition. So just to help again, know? just to help. Something that, that you've seen that made you laugh, smile, Right. You know, I'm a big family movie guy. I can get a little bit emotional while <laughs> watching movies with the family. I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is a Disney movie. There are so many good movies out there, you know, like uh, a lot of Christian family movies that and they pull on your heartstrings. You know, they, they got the, the laughter, the, the smile and cries. Let's see. But why don't we go with uh, Courageous? I like that movie. Courageous. So, Dan, again, I just want to reiterate. I love your heart. Thanks, bud. I love what you shared today. I love the vulnerability. Mm. And again, I think if somebody doesn't start putting guardrails in their life, they're really going to have to worry more about their life and they're really going to get off track. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, just to add a little bit, you know, really, I can say I didn't add any guardrails that the guardrails were placed there by my father, God. And I, I recognize them in hindsight. As I look back on my life, that's that's when I realized, oh, that person was a huge inspiration in my life they were a guardrail wasn't anything of my making let me put it that way <laughs> absolutely all right guys and gals kids and campers alike that is it that is all it is that time that we get to say goodbye but just for just for a week we'll be right back here next week i promise I promise right back here next week won't you join me but before we go i just want to ask you this question just something to think about as we as we get out of here and that's this what's the danger if you put a guardrail in your life what's the danger in that okay think about that for a second doesn't seem very dangerous. Flip side of that. Have you ever been on a road where there wasn't a guardrail? It's kind of scary. Like there's this part in our community when we're going to the Oregon coast. It's a very weird thing. We have to go through California then to come back up in Oregon. It's this road called 199. And there's a part of 199 as you're going back up into Oregon when you're in California. Really windy road. There is not a guardrail there. And I remember taking this turn one night. Raining night at time couldn't see really well and i'm like oh my gosh we almost went off the road why isn't there a guardrail there not that that guardrail would stop me but sometimes they are there to stop us but it's up to us whether we want to put them there or not so i'm going to challenge you in that if you don't have a guardrail in your life why not and if you do maybe remind that person or that guardrail if you're able to thank you thank you for being my guardrail thank you for keeping me on the road of life thank you for for allowing me to stay on the road because nobody wants to be in the ditch. Nobody does. Just remind you of that this week. So if you do that, let me know. I'd love to know. OPSpodcast.com, great place to let us know. You can, of course, let us know in the comments. You can let us know in the voicemail. You can let us know there on social media for OPS Podcast Show under Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Like us, follow us, tweet us there. We'd love that. And don't forget, I know one last thing not to forget, two things really, but don't forget. Don't ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.